We have a few questions, Jonah,、uh, and we know that you love、uh, food. So, how about、uh, I give the mic back to Will to ask the first question? All right. So, we're, we're talking food again. Favorite dish in the Philippines? And we're actually asking more than just what the food is. Where are you going to go to get it? Where? If it's a restaurant, or if it's you know, mom's home, or where, is, where are you getting it? And I have one too, by the way. I, I have been to the, the Philippines.、Uh, and, I'm and curious have, now. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm interested. I'll share a third, though. You guys go ahead. I actually want to hear your answer first, but、um, I thought about this, and I, I think my favorite dish is kare kare.、Um, for those who don't know, it's a peanut based stew,、um, mm-hmm. has oxtail, bok choy, eggplant, string beans,、um, often、uh, consumed with rice and shrimp paste. Uh, fermented fish, also known as magong.、Um, so <laughs> that's my favorite dish.、Um, here in Vancouver,、uh, we like to go to Culinaria.、Um, I think, I, I will not cite the address because I can't remember, but、um, Culinaria and Pampanga's cuisine, which is、yeah. also in Joyce Collingwood, I think.、Um, and they serve really good kare kare. But that being said, I have so many Filipino foods. So this is a very hard singular choice to talk about.、Um, Sidebar,、yeah. uh, Pampanga is actually the food basket of the Philippines. That's、so. right. It is、mm-hmm. the food capital.、Mm-hmm. So、uh, yeah, that, how about you, LJ?、Uh, I want to say、uh, the classic Filipino uh, uh, beef broth soup,、uh, sinigang. Sinigang na baka, which is sour、uh, sour soup.、Uh, usually, it's either、um, tamarind. Sometimes it's other different,、uh, I guess, like sour fruits or such as kamias. I'm not even sure what that is in English.、Um, some people use,、uh, I guess,、uh, pineapple. I've, I've seen that. Not my thing. Not my jam, to be honest.、Uh, I, I like to stick with the traditional、um, tamarind.、Uh, Based. It's very Southeast Asian, too, actually.、Um, now that, because、uh, uh, as Will mentioned, I did have some time spent in,、uh, in Singapore. And、uh, what I've noticed was、um, not only Sinigang has some Southeast Asian roots, it's also got,、uh, Kare Kare also has like, you know, very common Southeast Asian,、um, I guess,、uh, tropes such as the bagong,、uh, the、uh, shrimp paste.、Mm. That's a, a common、uh, fixture in Southeast Asia. In fact, it's not an exclusively Filipino thing, guys.、Um, that's true. There's also, <laughs>、uh, there's also uh, the, the peanut sauce. That's, that's very classic island Southeast Asia. In fact, you'll find that、uh, as a dressing for the chicken skewers, the pork skewers in,、uh, Sing- in Singapore, for example. <laughs>、um, yeah, so my favorite food would be Sinigang Nabaka. How about you, Will? <laughs> I'm curious.、Okay. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to share a, a, a Philippine story.、Uh, it doesn't evolve in X, so I'm going to apologize to my spouse in advance.、Uh, hopefully, she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> But、um, I'm, uh, I, was, uh, I went to、um, Manila and then I went to Angeles City.、Uh, and, and this was back in 2011. And then I told my uh, then um, girlfriend that I wanted to grab、uh, Sisig. Uh, from that was my second choice, in, but in, keep going. In, in actually, <laughs>、yeah. in Pampanga,、uh, at Aling Lusing Sisig,、um, that's where it was invented. Had, yeah, we had the, the roughest journey there. I think, like, she was puking, like, it was the worst kind of experience to get there because it was late night, like, we, we weren't like familiar with the, the weather and everything going on there. But you know, to get to that one spot and have that dish,、uh, and it being a Incredible and, and just the, like just seeing all the all the families there, everyone eating the same thing. And、uh, I still try to order it here, but it hasn't been comparable to to the one from the the place in Pavanga, I think, Lusing. So that, that'll be my choice. But I love Sisig, although it's going to show soon if I eat too much Sisig. That's a that's an excellent choice, <laughs> I gotta say. And you're right, don't have too much of it, it's not very good for you, <laughs> cholesterol and all. But yeah, good, good second choice, Jonah. So,、um, let me start off with、uh, sorry, continue on with the next question. What are the pros and cons of living in a country permanently or semi permanently、um, beyond visiting, that is, that's not your country of citizenship?、Um, there are a lot of pros and cons. I would say that a con really is being away from family.、Um, 
I recognize that I have cousins who are close to one another and I'm not as close to them just because we've been apart for so long. And when I visit, I come for Christmases and New Year's. So it's, it's really not the same. So that's definitely a con. Um, and um, the pros though, uh, just also exposure and meeting people of different backgrounds and different, you know, people come from everywhere and um, who see the world in, in many different ways. Like that's also, uh, that's a pro, I think, it, just the exposure. So that's what I would say. What do you guys think? So for me, well, um, it, it would be, uh, it would be China for the brief time that I was living there. And, I, and again, I was like in, I was an international student there. So I, I can't say it was like living long-term, but I stayed there almost for a year. Um, and I think the, the biggest pro of course is, you get to watch things from this weird lens of, of like, I'm not here from here, but I'm, I, I'm here and I get to watch the people watching and, and, and sort of feeling like outside of everything. So you don't necessarily feel impacted. You can sort of act maybe in, in ways that, you know, if you were in Vancouver, for example, you wouldn't start a string, a call, like a, a conversation with someone on, like on the street randomly, you know, in, in, in a foreign country, you sort of give yourself an excuse to, to do so, uh, to start conversations with people, to engage in things a little bit more, you know, testing your boundaries a bit. Um, but the cons on the, on the flip side are, are probably the same thing, like just feeling left out of certain conversations and feeling left out of certain interactions and hearing language that, that might be, you know, slightly unfamiliar to yours and, and you're never going to fully get it. And even if you get parts of it, you know, they're still laughing, you know, <laughs> you know, they're laughing at you after you say your thing, right? That, you know, I, I remember for me, uh, it was trying to like negotiate at the fruit stand and, and, and they were just laughing at me because they knew like, this guy knows nothing. Like we're going to, we're going to get him for sure. Like, <laughs> and, and they're, and I'm thinking, oh, I got a good deal while they're, you know, pocketing the money and being like, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's for me, it is. It's like being both an insider and an outsider at the same time as it's uh, pros and cons. I want to say uh, a hybrid of both your answers. I like to people watch. I like to, uh, one of the greatest pastimes of Parisians, I got to say, is sitting in cafes. And if you notice, if you've been to Paris, you'll notice that a lot of the cafes have their chairs facing outwards it's because a lot of Parisians are people watchers. So, so, so in a sense, that's sort of like, you know, where, where I stand in that. I, I like to observe people. I like to learn new things. Um, having spent time in Singapore, not my country of citizenship, for example, having spent a substantial amount of time in the U.S. and in France, it's, it's actually really interesting to actually learn something about them and also about myself and how, uh, you know, I position where in the world, where in this seriality of nationalities and identities do I belong? Where do I fit in? It's actually really interesting to, uh, you know, go through and live through. Wonderful. Great answer. So final question, and I know Jonah had a funny comment on this, <laughs> Google curling. Um, I, I low-key love curling. I don't know if I'll ever get all the rules and all the brushing and all the, you know, doubles and triples and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but ironically, it's one of the, it's, I think it's one of the most, one of the favorite sports of, of newcomers come here. We're like watching, they're like, what is this? But then slowly they're like, this is so much fun. Um, and actually, I don't know, Jonah, have you ever been curling? I have never tried it. I feel like yeah, I should. We got to <laughs> next time, uh, hopefully when they reopen, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll set up a, a curling game just for fun. It's, it's, it's super fun. <laughs> sliding all it around looks everywhere. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you must, if so you're going to form a curling team, uh, which has a lead, a second, a third, and a skip, which you're part of. So three other, uh, with three other racialized journalists in Canada, who would they be and why? So we'll start maybe with Jonah again, our guest on this show um yeah this was a very this is a very interesting question because I know nothing about curling apart from I think how it how it looks I think I have an image in my head of what people do when they're curling um so I had to look this up anyway so I'll answer this question first with the why uh, my assumption being I don't know if any of these people will want to curl with me but if we're going to work as a team I'm going to learn from them. I'll be in proximity to them. I'll probably pick up a thing or two, you know, um, from what they know and how they've built their own careers. So I would say um, Janela Massa, uh, the host and anchor of Canada Tonight. I would also say um, Eternity Martis, um, an author and a journalist. Uh, she wrote the book. They said this would be fun. Um, I attended 
a talk she gave recently, I think about diversity in journalism and it was, it was golden. Um, and the third person, I don't think, I don't know that she would identify as a journalist necessarily, but she is uh, the editor in chief of a literary magazine called Living Hyphen. Her name is Justine Abigail Yu. Um, and um, yeah, so these are the three, <laughs> the three women I would love to, you know, learn from and work with possibly in a curling team. Why not? <laughs> oh, wow, that's awesome. LJ, your three. I'm not going to pretend to know curling at all. Like <laughs> Jonah, I had to look it up and I feel like a terrible Canadian for not even like, you know, looking like it's only, it took me like 10 years to actually look, look it up. Um, so I apologize in classic Canadian fashion. But my picks, um, Michael Serapio, he's a host and anchor at the CBC. Um, in fact, funny story, we met each other at Alliance Francaise uh, during night school. Uh, we were both trying to pick up uh, French at the time. Um, had a lot of like nighttime chats and dinners and uh, he's a great guy and I pick him because he probably knows how to curl <laughs> he probably <laughs> at least understands the rule so someone can clue me in next would be you Jonah because I figured wow, that, judging from our conversation <laughs> that we'd both be noobs in this uh, new sport right uh, there's also Teresa Barrera over at Omni News yeah. um, as, a, as, as a third uh, I'm not sure if she does, but if she does, that would be great. Um, so at least Michael won't have to <laughs> babysit three people in the team. Uh, those are my picks. How about you, Will? So my three are Angela Sturt uh, from the CBC. I just think what she's doing around Indigenous issues and her writing and, and uh, speaking truth to power through journalism has been incredible. Uh, Nick Kuhn as well. I mean, we got to give our, our, our flowers to... Uh, Immigration uh, godfather of writing, uh, Nick Kuhn, who right. uh, always brings the stories and, and tells them and has really transformed the way immigration stories are written. I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, a, a trailblazer in that respect. And, and finally, a local choice, Andrea Wu. Uh, I, I love Andrea. I think her writing on um, the uh, issues around uh, the opioid uh, crisis in uh, especially the downtown east side and in Vancouver has been so humanizing, so eye opening. I hang on to everything she she writes and it educates me. And again, another humanizing writer. I don't know, Jonah, do you know um, Andrea? Have, yeah. you, have you met any of the three? I have not met them, but I followed their work. So I, I'm familiar with, with the journalists you all mentioned. Awesome, wonderful. <laughs> and, and we're going to be coached by Adrian Harwood because Adrian Harwood is Adrian Harwood. And uh, I just love <laughs> how Adrian Harwood doesn't, uh, you know, first of all, the years he puts in and put into the to, to, to being a journalist and being a Black journalist and also the way he he speaks out uh, even in light of all the corporate sometimes things that constrain him he, he's a powerful powerful voice so uh, he's going to be our coach adrian harwood <laughs> awesome <laughs> complete lineup <laughs> complete lineup yeah. awesome well thank you so much jonah for being here this was such a pleasure lj i'm gonna let you give the flowers <laughs> Jonah, thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you for speaking truth to power. Uh, we uh, are very grateful that you shared your stories with us today. And uh, we hope to continue our conversation off camera at some point. Absolutely. Thank you both, LJ and Will. It's really been a pleasure talking to you guys. And yeah, once the pandemic is over, uh, and LJ probably is in the West Coast, um, bubble all tea over time. bubble tea and seasick. We'll we'll continue to yes. do this. <laughs> <All right. laughs> awesome. Awesome. Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that was quite the um, conversation. Well, what did you think? Yeah, it was incredible. I learned so much from Jonah. I think she's so incredibly well spoken, thoughtful. Um, and, and just there's so much depth. I mean, I, I love when someone has so much depth to, to the words and, 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 and you can tell she's totally channeling her experiences in, in what she says. And, and that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, her lived experiences are very much telling and it basically like permeates how she writes. Uh, you and I have been both interviewed by Jonah and it's, it's uh, spectacular in how she frames her, uh, her stories. Which actually brings me to my point that from the very beginning, the aim of this podcast was to humanize human movement, migration, the practice of immigration law writ large, really. And by sharing stories, lived experiences, and the voyages of our fellow new Canadians, 
we in turn remind ourselves of how every thread of the story connects with each other. And immigrant stories are treated like they're in the gray zone for the most part. They're stuck in the interstices of dominant narratives, um, trying to catch the attention of the everyday passerby. Uh, the reality, however, is that Canada receives approximately 1% of its population annually through new permanent residents. So while there is still, they, they are still a minority, this number is staggering in terms of its impact, uh, whether it's social, economic, or political, and that's across the country and it cuts across class provinces. And we need to be mindful of this, I think, and um, especially in how we forget the continuous institutionality of ingrained um, I guess I want to call it erasure of indigenous cultures, mm -hmm. um, which is too often forgotten in uh, histories and narratives of immigration. And too often we frame our stories with dominant narratives uh, while forgetting the stories of the subaltern. And I guess I, I sort of want to end this with uh, a frame. And at the end of what, uh, at the end of the day, it's, you know, what we frame, it's how we frame rather, and what lens we use to perceive our current realities and perception is important. And that's where the job of a journalist becomes really difficult and very important at the same time. Framing is very important. And this is why Jonah's work is very important, especially to those who practice immigration law, whether you're a policymaker, you're a decision maker, you're a lawyer, a Quebec notary, or an immigration consultant, um, or an immigrant yourself. Uh, framing your stories, telling your narratives, and humanizing those stories. Very important things. Wow, that was a real talk. Thank you so much, LJ, for sharing that. Well, th thanks uh, for um, you know, helping me co-host this episode. It was very close to the heart, and I hope that uh, people uh, had picked very interesting and very important points from you know, uh, living in the margins, but at the same time, uh, not forgetting that you know, we all have lived experiences and that we are all human. Absolutely. And I, I love that this uh, episode also took us on a bit of a global trip from I don't know where we are in Canada, Vancouver, Toronto, to Hong Kong, to the Philippines. And, and definitely, I think it'll open some eyes and, and uh, people will think a little bit beyond just the, the simple narratives and, and, and the mainstream narratives, as you said, that right. oftentimes reduce our stories uh, in ways that do not reflect reality and the complexities uh, by which we come and, and now live. Uh, on these indigenous stolen lands. So LJ, next week is a special one. I think we're going to actually uh, not have a guest, but for a right. very uh, special reason. And what is that reason, LJ? I believe Will Tao and Mr. Dang Zalan here are going to talk to immigration policy people. Really? How is the podcast going to be on uh, to uh, sent to IRCC? Like, what, what's going on? This sounds very confusing. To well, me. <laughs> let me clarify that we're not doing the podcast with them as guests. We are actually uh, delivering a talk before policy people inside Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. It's a great honor, uh, and uh, what we aim in our next podcast episode to do is to essentially give you a report of some sort of uh, our uh, interaction, our points that we will be raising, our interaction and what the reactions would be from uh, our friends over at IRCC. So next week's episode's actually on the very, very important topic of transitions, which both LJ and I will be presenting on. And the reason we chose transitions is we've seen, especially through the pandemic, a, a huge negative impact on our clients and on individuals trying to navigate the system when they have to transition between statuses. Uh, so we are actually specifically looking at international students and caregivers, uh, but the broader context is definitely what we aim to better understand and hopefully share our experiences with the decision makers and the policy people so that they can make the rules uh, better for the community. Well, on that note, thanks for that, Will. And um, I'm really looking forward to the long weekend. I hope you have a restful one. Yeah. And please stay safe, everyone. I know right now we're heading into, uh, you know, we're already in the third wave of the pandemic and I know we're so close to the end and, and you know, not to sound like a public health official, uh, but I know <laughs> all of us, we, we really want to see you in person. We would love to do a live episode in the future. Uh, we hope through the long weekend, you and your family stay safe and healthy uh, so we can make that a reality in the near future. So thank you again for tuning in. This was episode three and thank you so much for being part of Imlight of all circumstances. See you next week.